Stan Mitchell, I somehow just started following him on Facebook and he like spoke to my soul, which yeah, I hadn't really felt that in a while. And so I reached out to him to do a podcast, which I didn't know if he would. And most, there's three guests on my podcast that aren't, don't identify as queer. And Stan would be one of them. So I didn't know if he'd be willing or not with my platform. But he was very willing. We had a beautiful podcast. It was during the pandemic. So we did, did it Zoom. And there's something about this man. He only functions by a phone, like me. So I love that. And... The whole podcast, he was walking in a forest. Sort of like Joseph Smith. Kind of. (laughs) Very similar. Walking, talking. I'm like, could you sit down, please? Anyway, he was... We found out he used to be a Mormon. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, so he... um, You can share this in more detail because it's sort of funny, but as a kid, his best friend or really close friend was LDS, and so he'll tell about his religion, religious upbringing, but very orthodox and what he was, but they would take turns going to church. And then they both decided, let's get baptized in each church, just like insurance. So he's on the records of our church. And he tried to, he tried to be added to I'll walk with you. And I deleted it immediately and contacted him. I said, you, dude, you have to be a Mormon. You have to have a gay kid. But now he's, can be added. <laughs> anyway. He's, he's very special, and I'm so happy you're all here to hear from Pastor Stan Mitchell. I'm going to take that. Yeah, he's got a microphone. So I don't need this. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm honored to be here. I actually am in Salt Lake this weekend. First time I've been in Salt Lake in 33 years. I think the last time I was 21 when I was here, but I I was here this weekend, Friday and Saturday, working with a group of six Methodist ministers and a Presbyterian minister who are in non-affirming denominations, but are 40, 50 year old ministers with wonderful careers, wonderful churches, but they're in non-affirming churches, but they themselves are affirming. And so I met with them, which is about a fourth of what I do is work with ministers and churches um, who are towing the threshold of inclusion. And so I was here, and so, of course, being friends with Jill, I called and said I would love to stay a little bit longer. I didn't plan on all of this, but I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I am not a former Mormon. Um, there, there's the reorganized folk. I suppose at best I was a disorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My best friend and I, he, he was a faithful LDS guy, four generations deep. And so for whatever reason, our parents allowed us to go back and forth to the churches. So when we were 11 or 12, we decided to hedge our bets and cover it both ways. And so we did. I didn't tell my parents because I knew they would have thought it washed off my other baptism. And I don't think he told his. But I, I grew up very much a part of an LDS ward for the first 18 years of my life. And And it wasn't a lot different because my world was fundamentalist Pentecostal. And as fundamentalist as you could get, not only fundamentalist, but exclusivist in a way that most traditional Wesleyan Methodist Pentecostal people were not. I was a part of a denomination five generations deep. So I was a pioneer. I was five generations deep in this little Pentecostal denomination that believed we were the only Christians. We did not believe, of course we didn't believe LDS folk, we didn't believe Catholics, we didn't believe Methodists, we didn't believe other Pentecostals like Assembly of God or Church of God were saved. Our narrative, see if this sounds familiar, our narrative was that the church essentially went dormant after the first 100 to 300 years. And it was in the period of dark ages and then we were a few decades behind you guys, but a group of my ancestors at the beginning of the 20th centuries got a revelation from God. And so we were called apostolic Pentecostals because we had restored the apostolic doctrine that had been dormant for 18 centuries. So we were the only, we were the only people who had the truth 
Um, I would say that we thought we were the only ones saved, but we were so fearful of God, we didn't even think we were saved. We just thought if anybody had a chance, it might be us. That's how rigid we were. So, I, interestingly, my friend and I did the reciprocity of baptisms, but more than that, I think the biggest impact for both of us, we're still dear friends, was by the time we were 11 or 12 and had been in one another's church dozens, if not hundreds of times, we began to piece together that they were essentially saying the same thing, not in the best of ways, but that both of these groups, there were these two little boys going back and forth, and we just kind of began figuring out both these groups are saying they exclusively have the corner on God. So how are we going to figure this out? Are we going to flip a coin? We decided not to flip a coin. We just decided to cover the bases and get baptized both ways. But <laughs> So that's the world I, I, I come from. I, I now, just a, a little bit of history, I, I deconstructed all of that, ended up in 2003 starting a, a church in Nashville that essentially we started to be a deconstruction zone for Christian people. And we did have my, my co-pastor and chief elder for many years, who's still one of my dearest friends, was a Community of Christ guy, seven generations deep, Community of Christ, had been a pastor 30 years. So that was, he came from that world, although the Community of Christ was already quite a bit more progressive. But we did have a, a large number of LDS people. We had a lot of Church of Christ people, a lot of Catholic people. We really tailored our, our space for Christian people who were disoriented. Christian people who, for whatever reason, the orthodoxy, the certainty, the rigidity of their past was just not making sense for them anymore. And our church grew and grew and grew because in the buckle of the Bible Belt Nashville, there was quite a, there's quite a market for that. There were a lot of people that, whether Baptist, Methodist, LDS, whatever, it just wasn't making sense for them anymore. And so Grace Point grew and grew and grew. And then in 2012, when the Marriage Amendment Act came out, I knew that we had to be more than a deconstruction zone because now I faced a pastoral ethic. I was personally fully affirming, which meant I, I believed that same gender romantic love was no different to God than heterosexual love. This was not something that I was generously, magnanimously offering some grace to queer people that maybe it's okay, maybe it's not, but God forgives. I truly, biblically believed that we were wrong on that issue. But I was pastoring a church that was really a deconstruction zone, and that was our main focus. But with the Marriage Amendment Act, I knew now, and of course, in that kind of a space in the Bible Belt, there were going to be a lot of queer people there though we weren't fully affirming. And you've got to remember, we've come a long way in the last year, 10 years. In 2012, Barack Obama was not even saying that he was affirming of same-sex marriage or same-gender marriage. That, that's hard for some of us to remember, but he was still promoting civil union as opposed to marriage. So a lot's happened in the last 10 years. So we weren't there, but honestly, in, in that area, rampant evangelicalism, our church was freighted with queer people because they were getting the best offer they could possibly get. They honestly were like the Syrophoenician woman. Everywhere else, they were pushed away from the table. At our place, they weren't quite at the table. But as I reflectively said a few years ago, looking back, they... Everywhere else in our, in our religious world, they starved. At least at Grace Point, they were able to feed off of the inadvertent communion, wine-soaked crumbs that fell from the corner of our mouth. And they scrambled beneath our table like a Jim Crow South after chattel slavery. They weren't dying in the fields of thirst, but they were drinking poison from a fountain with a placard above it and a word. And... For a time, that worked, and we were the best deal in town. But with the Marriage Amendment Act, I knew that ethically, as in, within my ordination, my sense of being a, a shepherd, a pastor, I, I couldn't tell this group of people that I wouldn't marry them, that I wouldn't ordain them. 
And I knew the church wasn't quite at that place yet, so I went to our elders and said, this is where I am. And the elders agreed that they didn't want me to leave. And so we agreed to do a period of discernment, and we set out on a two-and-a-half-year period of discernment that eventually ended up in us becoming a fully affirming, celebrating. And I don't, I don't like the words friendly, welcoming, inclusive, affirming, because that, that's a bit self-congratulatory. I finally realized we weren't magnanimously standing and saying, we now welcome you to the table. The queer people had always been at the table. We were the one joining them. And if you read the dietary habits of Jesus, who he was always with, it wasn't the religious folk. And I, so I, I don't, any, any longer, I don't talk about Grace Point. I'm still the founding pastor at Grace Point. There's a new lead pastor, and I do this work mostly. I, I never look back now and say we're an affirming church. We became a repentant church. We repented. Statements of affirmations need to be statements of amends. We're not inviting them to the table. We're joining them. They've been with Jesus all along. We're the ones finally getting there. And that's the only way I can read the story of Jesus. But a little bit about me. I, so we, we did the marriage. Uh, we, we did the full affirmation in January of 2015. We lost about, um, we lost about 2,500 people. And we sold our campus, and I spent 2015 to 2019 with uh, the remnant restoring, stabilizing, and now Grace Point's a wonderful congregation of about 500 people. On any given Sunday post-COVID, we'll have 150 to 200 people. Uh, the new lead pastor is a young man that I had mentored. He led a Southern Baptist church in rural Kentucky to full inclusion. He's a remarkable young man. He took my place, and now I'm, I'm the founding pastor, which I've told a lot of you. Founding pastor is wonderful. It's like the Queen of England. No responsibility, no power. Just sit around and make sure all the new people know who you are. <laughs> so it's a lovely kind of thing. I get to, like, watch this fruit of my labor, and, and I'm still a part behind the scenes. But I, a fourth of my work is working with church, like the Methodist ministers who are scared to death. And, and they're, as I, I told them today, scarcely in any Western setting will any of us ever have anything remotely that approximates taking up a cross and following our Lord. This may be the only chance you ever have in your life to do something in Christ's name that actually would cost you. And so I do that work with ministers and churches. I have about 15 churches right now that I'm consulting with. Consulting's great. My dad always said a consultant, it, well, he said it like this. He said a big shot's just a little shot a long way from home. So farther out I go, the wiser I get. But farther away I get from my kids, the wiser I get. But I do that work. Most of you know me, or the ones who do know me know me, because three-fourths of what I do is I really serve as a pastor to a diaspora. Um, a diaspora of queer people and their families who are all over America, Canada, um, Latin America, Asia now. I, I serve a group of people whose child came out. I serve Baptist, Assembly of God, Church of Christ, LDS people who have been blown away, their child is in a psych psychiatric unit after a failed suicide attempt, and they are so disoriented. I don't like the word deconstruction because that feels too active. Most of us entered into that breakdown of our faith, not in an active, intentional deconstruction, but we were sideswiped by circumstances in life that left us disoriented. I think that's a better word. And and so essentially what I do is every morning I wake up and I spend the first two hours of the day responding to direct messages that come in overnight. Um, probably 30 to 40 percent of the messages come between 1 and 4 o'clock in the morning because that's the witching hour when these kids and these parents uh, just got one last night and it's kind of fresh. But 
it, it's uh, that's the direct messages come in three to 15 a day. I spend the first two hours immediately calling them back, giving them my phone number because most of these people are in really crisis situations and I don't want them to wait 48 hours. And then I spend eight to 12 each morning writing one of these posts. And, you know, it takes 30 minutes to write this much. It takes four hours to write this much and distill it down because it's really, Facebook's tough because if you get past three paragraphs, everybody acts like it's war and peace or, you know, and people share my post and if it's five paragraphs, they'll be like, I know this is long, but stick with it. And I'm like, my God, what? I thought Anna Karenina was long. Why, what's, how's five paragraphs long? But I write these posts and the post that I write, if you don't know, I figured out early on that I was not a voice for the voiceless. That is such a patronizing, demeaning thing to say. My LGBTQ free, my LGBTQ friends are not without voice. They have as much of a voice as I do. I realized as a cisgender, heterosexual, white, evangelical, middle class, entitled guy, the privileges that I had was not a privilege of voice in the absence of theirs. I had a privilege of a microphone, an amplification system, and a platform. And for people of privilege, we can either dismiss the privilege and do away with it, and that's one way to handle it, or we can steward it. And the way that I found to steward it was, and, and this is, it's, it's become my ministry, all my Facebook posts are is I just turn the microphone over to the stories of these people. Parker Palmer said it's amazing that a religion supposedly vested in the idea of incarnation so often gets lost in disembodied concepts. I have found that the thing, and you guys are living proof of it, the thing that moves the needle are stories. God did not come to this world in a leather-bound book. God came and the word was made flesh. And I quickly realized instead of debating text like a theologian, if I will just turn the microphone and this platform over to the stories of these human beings, the stories that I was reading and being so moved by, I tell those stories, more messages come in, and the messages I respond to, and I've just ended up, it felt, it felt strange three years ago, but with COVID, everybody became, you know, screen pastors, and so, I've ended up pastoring hundreds, thousands now of people around the country who just have a queer kid that they can't take back to the Southern Baptist Church. And they're hundreds of miles from the nearest Grace Point, the inclusive church I pastor. And they don't know what to do. And they live in small towns in South Dakota and Idaho and Delaware. And I just have committed to be a pastor to that diaspora of people and, and to work with them at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and their faith the people who become so angry at the church, so wounded at the church, that they leave the church outright, they skip over me. I don't, I don't do much for them. They think that I am feeding into Stockholm Syndrome and sending people back to abuse, and I understand that. I do understand that. But for whatever reason, I still believe as dirty as the bathwater is, there's a really important baby in that muck. And I do, I, I, I said today, I, I don't know, I am trying to do what some of you are doing and that's lead and reform and help my religion mature from within. Sometimes I think I'm watching Christianity grow and I hear people like Richard Rohr and I see people like you and I think oh, Christianity just might make it. And then other days I get gut punched so hard, I think that at most I'm just doing hospice palliative care for a religion that needs to die. And I love it, and I'm just trying to help it decently fade. And I live and I vacillate between those two places, but I'm not an angry kind of person. I'm a conciliatory person, and I still am deeply moved by Jesus. And I still talk in Jesus and talk in the Bible. And I really, I really never changed my heart toward queer people. I've always loved queer people. I don't think love was the issue. I didn't start loving queer people. I changed my mind about what scripture said and who Jesus was. And so I want to say something about who you are. I wrote this letter after the Pulse nightclub shootings. I wrote this to the mama bears, the evangelical version of LDS mama dragons. 
I wrote this when the mom, in 2016, right after the Pulse nightclub shooting. My friend Liz Dyer, who started the Mama Bears, Southern Baptist woman whose kid came out as queer and she didn't handle it well, almost destroyed him, finally figured things out, started the Mama Bears. 2016, after the Pulse nightclub shootings, I wrote this letter to 1,400 Mama Bears. In the last six years, that number's up now approaching 40,000. There are 40,000 Mama Bears. So there is a movement, but the prophets in this movement, the prophets and bishops and shepherds in this mooting movement are not cloaked clerics and trained theologians. They are, they are mothers and fathers of this body of Christ, <laughs> this Christ child that has been born into our lives that we thought was a curse, that Simeon lifted up and said, he will bless the nations, but the sword that pierces his side will pierce your side too. I, I believe the true prophets and the prophetic edge of this movement is not coming from the ivory tower and from the bishop's desk. It's from that theologically perhaps untrained mother of the one that even the angels said, don't talk about this because nobody would believe you. Just ponder it in your heart. And when, when all the theologians scatter, you'll be the one standing there. And when the sword pierces his side, it will pierce deep into you, Mary, blessed of God. So I wrote this to my mama bear friends because I, I, who would have thought that my companions in this ministry would be the Jill Hazard Rose and the Liz Dyers and mama bears and mama dragons. I thought I would live my life out with theologians and pastors and bishops. After the pulse shooting, I wrote, and, and, I, and I wanted to say this to you guys. Without question, this is a raw and vulnerable week for our LGBTQ plus siblings and their families. The indifference, the ignorance, the cruelty, though always difficult to stomach, have been made especially unbearable for our hearts now in our hearts now broken in 49 additional ways, the 49 deaths of the Pulse shooting. And magnifying the unbearableness for us this week is the indecent fact that more often than not, these heartaches come from those closest to us, our families, our churches, and our friends. So what do we do, dear Mama Bears, with our disappointment, our hurt, our anger, yea, our bitterness? How do we prevent our sadness and pain from spiraling down, down into a paralyzing resentment and isolating bitterness? In Emily Dickinson's poem, A Great Hope Fell, she described what happens when emotional wounds go untended and become infected. The wound, Dickinson wrote, the wound grew so large until my whole life fell into it. To keep this from being our lot, we must submit our wounds to the antibodies of grace, love, mercy, and divine perspective. And we must remember, as we are subjected to the insensitivities and ignorance of even those closest to us, that such for some of us, that we once held those same similar opinions, those same damaging ideas, and then our lives changed. Our lives changed as we were gifted with a child a child set us apart from the rest of our ward, the rest of our church. A child came who happened to be gay, bisexual, or transgender. We were like the patriarch Jacob at Jabok, weren't we? We at first wrestled with this gift, this presence of God in our lives as though it were an enemy. We were like the carpenter Joseph. We sought to put away Mary privately from our life, knowing beyond all knowing that her pregnancy was the worst thing that had ever happened to us, watching her growing belly as obvious proof of heartbreaking immorality, when actually, surprise, dear Joseph, actually it was heaven's greatest gift. So surprise, dear Mama Bear, surprise, dear Jacobs among us, surprise, dear Josephs, you whose hip was dislocated at Jabok, you whose name was changed, surprise, dear Joseph. You whose heart was broken, but then taught God to count and walk. 
And surprise, precious mama, mother bear. Surprise, sweet Mary, born again. Your worst nightmare has actually become your most beautiful dream. Oh, where would you be? What attitudes would you hold? What doctrine would you believe had it not been for this Christ child conceived, carried, and born by you? This one you have watched through elementary and middle school years, filling up in her body the sufferings of Jesus that were incomplete. What blessed mothers you are. Highly favored sweet Marys are you among women. Surely in this you have learned that sometime blessings come wrapped as curses, kings come dressed like paupers, and indeed we entertain angels unaware. So we, may we now be gracious to those who have yet to wrestle with God until their hips were dislocated, to those who have yet to have their hearts changed. May we be forgiving of those who seek to put us away privately along with our child, and at times not so privately. Dear Mama Bears, your limp, your love, your story, your persistence, your courage, your pain, and even your channeled anger may be the very thing that finally tenderizes the hearts of those, those that we love so much, those that have caused our children so much pain. Perhaps one day, those whose wombs were not opened by this Christ, perhaps their mind will be. Until then, Remember, you may be the bruised and pierced ones, but you are indeed the blessed ones. So, Amen. that's the way I feel about you guys. To give an example of yesterday morning, I was at Snow, um, what's Snow Pine Lodge up at Alta, and I met with these seven ministers. They wanted to get as far away from their congregations and their district as possible. They didn't dare do anything down the mountain where maybe somebody from the congregation or their bishop would run into them. So we went off like Nicodemus and found us a Judean moon shining down through a sycamore tree and we come to Jesus under the cover of night at a very nice snow pine lodge. <laughs> and part of the work that I did with them was I brought them into my day and I let them listen to one of these calls. I generally do two, somewhere between two to four FaceTime Zoom calls with these families uh, around the country. And yesterday I asked one of those families if they would be willing for these seven ministers to just be a fly on the wall and watch. And I write th wrote this post yesterday morning, and this gives you a sense of what's happening in my world and, and what I do. This morning, I FaceTimed with a mother and her 17-year-old son. The teen came out to his parents a few months back. These are Assembly of God Pentecostal conservative people. They live in Missouri. The teen came out to his parents a few months back. Almost immediately, the mother was fully affirming. Unfortunately, to date, the father has not joined his wife in the affirmation of their child. We spoke for more than an hour, and many lovely things were shared. One, though, especially struck me. The 17-year-old said, quote, My dad hasn't outright said he doesn't accept this, but I can tell he doesn't. I responded, I guess it's clear because even though he hasn't said he doesn't accept this, neither has he said he does. The young boy answered, well, yes, that's true, but it's more than that. My dad's never been good with words. It's just not his way of showing up. There was a pause. After a bit, I asked, then how is it you know? He was pensive. He thought for a moment and then said, I guess it's really two things. I mean, it's probably more than these two, but these are how I feel it most. He continued, I haven't said this out loud even to mom, so I'm not sure if it will make sense, but it's how he looks at me, and it's how he touches me, or mostly doesn't. Like I said, 
My dad isn't very verbal. He's a physical kind of guy. I mean, in a really great way. All my life, he's always wrestling, high-fiving, chest-bumping, holding hands, hugging, down on the floor with us kids. That's the way his parents and whole family is. But I don't know how long it's been since he looked at me the way he used to before I came out. I mean, like in my eyes. I don't know how long it's been since he grabbed me and hugged me. I used to couldn't pass him in the hall without there being something like that. I still try, and I guess he does hug back. He hugs back, but not the way he used to hug me. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. Mom, you can tell me. But it just feels different now. He looked out the window, and he said it just feels a lot different. And his eyes, yeah, it's his eyes. His face is just a lot different when they're looking at me. Long pause, no words. His mom sitting beside him was teary. I could tell she was undone, struggling with all her might not to let the dam at her lower eyelid break. It was obvious she knew once it spilled the first droplet, droplet of liquid grief, both she and her child would have been swept away by the torrent of emotions that brewed, swelled, and roiled in their chest. For my part, I did all I could do. There are seven ministers sitting back behind me watching this happen, trying to figure out how they're going to make a living when they lose their livelihood. And they're watching this, trying to figure out now how they can maintain their livelihood and not take care of children like this in their own congregations without losing their soul, which is a lot more important than their livelihood. For my part, I sil silently held his gaze. There are times you just know to shut up. I held his gaze as lovingly as I could knowing that with all of my might, these eyes, no matter how they stared, no matter how they loved, could not replace the eyes, the two that he longed for, to set themselves upon him. I held his gaze as lovingly as I could, as much as one can through a screen. I remember trying hard not even to blink, feeling I couldn't leave him even for the millisecond required to clear and naturally reset my eyes. And yet I knew even if my eyes and heart gave him everything they had, they couldn't have taken the place of those eyes, that heart belonging to the one he needs so much, those eyes that have ceased looking his way. Finally, he continued, I'm probably not explaining this well, but after 17 years, you know what your dad's hugs feel like. You know how he looks at you. You know what? Even his angry looks, the one I used to hate, I would get everything to have just one of those, because even those had love in them, you know. He believed in me that I was good and could do better than I had done, whatever it was that upset him. Yeah, I wish he would just look at me even angry. But his eyes are empty now, at least when he's looking at me. Pause. Yeah, I, I guess that's how I know. And so this morning, I'm inspired to redouble my efforts. And while I generally su share success stories on this Facebook page, it's true, for those who are experiencing grief akin to my new young friend's grief, hearing only those kinds of stories, success stories, stories about love at its best, well, that can create its own kind of grief. The kind of grief that comes from feeling alone, from feeling like things are working out for others and wondering why they aren't working out for me. What are they doing that I'm doing wrong. It's true, both weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice carry within the respective acts their own form of comfort. And daily, those of us who are privileged to do this labor of love live the paradox of carrying both of those acts, weeping and rejoicing within the same soul. So what that looks like is I write that and 855 people click on it. And what I found is through research, Repre that 855 
that's you guys. That's people who are already kind of out there. That 855 for everyone who clicks, there's another three who later write and say, I followed you for years but never dared click because I didn't want somebody to know. And then there's 62 comments. Generally, there's a lot of comments, and that's all mama bears and mama dragons who sweep in and things like this and support. And these kids, these people tell me, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, the older I get, my dew point's getting lower and lower, and I'm just getting, I'm just a mush these days, but these kids tell me, I can't tell you how many times I have kids, I write their story, and then they sit from afar, and they watch from the silence of their bedroom, and they tell me they read these comments over and over and over, wishing it was their mom and dad. So the comments are important. And then there are 99 shares on this. And then all, I, I go to those 99 shares, and it opens up whole new worlds of people. And out there where this gets shared, that's where the really, I don't let the ugly stuff here. But out there in the sharing, I sometimes despair and just have to get off because that's, that's people who are brave enough to share, and then they get hammered. But the real magic, the real magic and the real ministry is somewhere between, like I said, three and 15 people respond to me. And it's queer kids, queer people, their families, they respond to me and I respond back to them and I promise them, I send them my phone number immediately and say, I don't wanna be presumptuous, but if you need a pastor, I'm here. And it generally takes a couple back and forth before they believe that I'm really telling the truth. They can't believe that. It's like 90% of my work is just sending my phone number and just caring. And for those that follow me on Facebook, inter when they find me on Facebook, interspersed in my Facebook is my story with my mom. And I didn't really mean to do that intentionally. I just put up some posts about my mom with dementia. And I'll tell you what that's done. It's a lovely, my mom's a lovely woman and it's a beautiful story. But it's not what my Facebook page is for in general. But I tell you what it's done, it's humanized me to a lot of people who were able to hold me off as sulfurous breath, yellow eyes, you know, claws and a talon, this demonic person. And now all of a sudden they have to see me singing hymns with my mom and taking care of her. And it's kind of a mind, you know what, for a lot of evangelical people. But it humanizes me and gives me some credibility. But amongst those, I get these kinds of messages that came this morning. She said, I have a lot to say about this post, but the one thing, I, this is a 60 year old woman, evangelical woman, and tell me if you can't remember this and resonate with this. I have a lot to say about this post, but the one thing I need to say about after reading all the comments is that how dare all of these people who don't know my son act like they love him more than I do. Just because a parent doesn't affirm his or her child doesn't mean they don't love them with all their heart and would give their life for them. I know this child you wrote about doesn't feel truly loved because they believe affirming equals love, but nothing could be further from the truth. There's many things in life that our loved ones do that we don't agree with or affirm, but that doesn't mean we don't fully love them. How do you resonate with what the Bible says that you've read all your life and do a 360 once your child comes out and decide the Bible doesn't mean that for your child? Trust me, I've wrestled and wrestled since 2017 because I want to know God's truth. My heart breaks daily that I can't tell my son that I believe God made him this way to love men. I don't understand why so many others can reject what the Bible says, people like you, unless they don't believe the Bible anymore. I honestly wish I could do that. I wish I could see it the way you do, but I can't. What loving mama wouldn't want to be able to do that? I don't care what others say. If only, I only care what God says. If God told me tomorrow to affirm my son, I would do it happily without question, without worrying what everyone thinks. But for some reason, God hasn't told me that, and that's what breaks my heart. Is it love to tell my son I affirm him and what he's doing is okay with God when I know in my heart it's not? God's not a God of confusion. You're confusing people, and all those mama whatevers are confusing people too. I need you to leave my son the hell alone. God gives us joy even in difficult circumstances, but my son lost his joy in Christ when he came out. 
I haven't seen him happy since then. How is that God's plan for him? I looked back to her name and the son that she's talking about began corresponding with me three years ago and I went back through our correspondences. He's a highly successful trial lawyer on the East Coast. He's 35 year old, years old, highly acclaimed, and he's broken hearted because there's a six year old child inside of him because the years of our life are like the concentric rings of the tree. They're not calendar pages we throw away. And his heart, I went back through three pages of our interaction. She's breaking his heart. So I know him. A soft answer turns away wrath. I work at the intersection of two wounds. Long before I began caring for LGBTQ people, my initial work was to help people come out and mature from the abuses of fear-based exclusivist religion. I work at the intersection of those two wounds, the wounds of religious people fearing God and thinking awful things about God and LGBTQ people who have endured that abuse. I wrote back to her this morning and said, I hear you. And I actually defend the point you just made quite often. I've written many posts about just that. I tell people all the time, I didn't change my heart toward gay people. I changed my mind about what scripture said. I want you to know if it sounded like a group of people were saying they love your child more than you, that is not what I intend because that's not true. And for me personally, I never appeal to parents like you to love your child. I know you love your child. You love your child more than I ever could. But it's because of your love that I appeal to you. I'm not asking you to love your child more. I'm asking you to read the Bible differently because I believe it does read differently. I don't think your heart and love are the problem. I think there's another way of reading scripture. That's the work I do. I'm sorry if in any way this was offensive. She read it immediately, was active in the chat, and then turned it off, and I know she simmered and stewed. She wrote back this afternoon while I was at the other meeting and said, thank you. Thank you. I hoped I would offend you and run you off. I hoped you would be cruel to me. I hoped you would be mean to me so that I could say, see there. But your kindness has opened in something inside of me. This way of reading scripture you talk about, it scares me to death. But I have other things that scare me to death. My highly successful son told us a few months ago that he doesn't want to live and that scares me to death. So living between these two fears, if you would be willing to pastor this person, this woman who was so rude to you earlier, I think I would like that. So, so that's the space that we're holding. That's the space that you guys are holding. That's the space you've lived. That's the story you've lived. Everything I just said, plus or minus 5%, you could have said the exact same thing. I am... Um, I'm really grateful. I I feel like I every morning when I get up I just need to take my shoes off. To every day. You know, I I have done I have done 12 queer teenage loss of life to suicide services in the last 14 months every one of them religiously induced. And my appeal to the Christian church, and I'll leave off with this, and then maybe we can converse a little bit. My appeal to the Christian church is I changed on this issue, not in tension with my Christianity, but because of my Christianity. Periodically in church history, and I think one of the things that I've always resonated with, and I think, the LDS part of the Christian faith gets right is at least in theory this idea of progressive revelation. 
evangelicals where I come from act like all truth flatlined at the end of the first century. And there's just not, there's nothing about that that theoretically makes sense, but even church history doesn't indicate that. I, I, I always, on behalf of Progressive Revelation, appeal to my Protestant evangelical friends and say, church history indicates that time and again, there have been many pivotal moments in church history from our earliest days when the church has had to face the reality that we have gotten some really major issues terribly wrong. And, and the horror is that we have the capacity to get some really important things wrong, like chattel slavery and race relations and so many things, women, so many things we've gotten wrong. But we also have the capacity to be corrected. And, and the way that happens, the story of church history, is that never happens through the ivory tower or through academics or theologians or professional clerics. When God chooses to come into the world in reformative ways, he generally picks obscure little teenage girls on the back side of the wrong side of town. And he doesn't come through divinity school or pulpits or tabernacle choirs. He comes, he comes in ways that we could have never imagined he would have come. And in church history, we have made major reformative moves. Generally, it happens this way, incarnationally, human spirit experience, and in most cases, it's human suffering, builds to such a fevered pitch that these human experiences these human experiences are dissonant with our received dogma and they don't align, they don't make sense when, try, when we try to reconcile them to our doctrine. And there's this, there's this incredible tension that, it's exactly what Peter, when he preached to the Gentiles and then he went and reported it to James, the brother of Jesus, remember? I mean, Peter, that's the position that I've tied, tried to take as a minister. I don't want to be a rogue. I don't want to be a dissident. I, I want to be a part of the church. I don't want to leave the church. But when Peter heard the call to share the gospel with the Gentiles, he didn't go to the bishops and the elders and ask for permission. He did what the sacred voice told him to do. But at the same time, he didn't then go back to the church, flip them off and say, God told me. He went back, submitted himself, and was willing to accept whatever sanction, whatever absence of recommend, whatever you call it, he was willing to accept that. He reported to James humbly, this is what I did. And James, the brother of Jesus, looked at him. This is right out of the chute in the church. James looked at him and said, you shouldn't even have eaten with those people. The Christian church was built on a foundation of almost immediately getting the issue of exclusion and inclusion wrong. And it wasn't about 10 to 20% of society. Right from the beginning, we believe 99.9% .9 of the earth's population, they were called Gentiles, had no access to the gospel because of the way they were naturally born. Isn't that amazing? And when Peter looked at James and said, I did it. James, full of the Holy Spirit, looked at him and said, you shouldn't have eaten with them. Peter didn't argue scripture. He went to the experience, the incarnational experience, and he looked at James and said, I argued the same point, and I don't know how to reconcile the Bible on this. I just got to tell you what I saw. The Holy Spirit fell on them as it did on us in the beginning, and I don't know what to do with that. James, this is the Christian ethic. James didn't look back and say, well, the Bible trumps all. James leaned back and said, how do we argue that? Five chapters later, James, who rejected Peter's testimony, five chapters later, he defends the Gentile inclusion and quotes Amos 9. Amos 9 didn't change. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus defended the idea of progressive revelation by saying, you heard it say, but I say unto you. The problem isn't what it said. The problem is in the hearing. When people say, Stan, don't you believe in the authority of the Bible? I say, of course I do, but I don't believe in the authority of your interpretation. And if I do, how are we going to pick which exclusivistic denomination, my little Pentecostal one or my buddy's LDS, how are we going to pick which one really has the corner? At some point, that logic begins to wear thin. 
we go back to the text. Human experience drives us back to the text. We know we can't dismiss the experience. We know we don't want to dismiss the text. So we are driven by humility to say we have the capacity to get things wrong. We have before, we will again. We go back to the text and the question is not, is the Bible right? The question is, have we read this most faithfully today? And the reason why we can get some things right in the 70s or 1865 or 2015 that we didn't get right before is because on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus said, I have so much I want to tell you. But you can't bear it. God's not playing cat and mouse with us, but as human consciousness grows, we have the capacity to hear things we couldn't hear before. God didn't change God's mind on chattel slavery in the 19th century. The church was finally able to hear the voice of the Lord. We finally grew ears. Time, suffering, experience grows ears that we have the capacity to hear things we couldn't hear before. And I am casting my soul in life that LGBTQ inclusion is one of those. We have been wrong and we have heaped a burden on a group of people. And as Jesus said, it was an unbearable burden. I looked at my 23 year old cisgender heterosexual son the other day and said, what if God told you you could never touch a woman the rest of your life and you had to find a man and love him and make love to him and live with him the rest of your life? My son looked out the window of the car we were riding in and he said, I think I would just ask God to take me. And I said, exactly, son. That's why these kids want to die. That's why these people don't want to live. Jesus said, you've put a burden on them. And he said, the damnedest thing is when they collapse under the load of it, you look at their heaped collapse and you say that's because of sin in your life and you don't lift a pinky to help them and you pour acid into their wound and the wound that they bear is not the suffering of sin it is the filling up in their body of the unjust suffering of the Christ who was crucified without cause and that's where we are and so I would never recommend you take your kids back towards where they're going to hear damaging things but if there's any way to stay connected to this group of people i want to tell you if you wouldn't have been gifted with that christ child who was queer where would you be so as safely as we can let's keep taking our story back to them there's a lot more of us still there we have got to be Harriet Tubman. We've got to go back and build an underground railroad of grace that they can access. And there's no, but we don't do that by marching in and telling them how wrong they are and quoting scripture. We do that by making the word become flesh and telling the story of our children. And if that doesn't move the needle, then the needle won't be moved and Christianity needs to die. And maybe that's what needs to happen. It happened to our Lord and things out, turned out pretty well. Sometimes deaths don't lead to a terminal place. Sometimes they are resurrective and sometimes things just need to die. But in the meantime, let's keep telling our stories. That's the work that I do and that's the work that you guys do. And you're an inspiration to me. I, I stayed over this weekend just because I wanted to be around you guys. And just to, um, so I feel very privileged. So. I hope some of this makes sense. I'm really, really, really honored to fight on behalf of your kids. Uh, I really, I love them. I love them, and it's the greatest honor of my life. So I feel like I'm finally doing the work of Jesus after 38 years of pastors and committees and building buildings and children's programs and raising attendance and up and to the right. So it's lovely work. So God bless you guys. Thank you. Oh, and I wanted to say one thing. You guys are all parents. 
Val, would you wave your hand? Val, Val's mom has been one of my best friends for years. Val's mom and I graduated from Greene County Tech High School in Perigold, Arkansas. I was Pentecostal, she was Southern Baptist. She, we were such close friends. She used to go with me to revivals. Little did she know, I was trying to convert her. Her mom, Kathy, never got it, never converted. And, but but we, we were dear friends, have stayed dear friends all through the years. My mom married my dad when she was 16, dropped out of school. When I went to college, my mom, who was 37 when I was 18, went to college with me, got her GED, went to college, graduated cum laude, had a 25-year teaching career, and was a mentor to Val's mom, Kathy, my friend, who became a teacher, now is an EDD and runs a big department at the University of Arkansas and is a really successful educator in Arkansas. But Val's here because about a year ago, Kathy reached out to me, which is really gratifying because I feel like Jesus sometime, I do my work everywhere else, but in my Nazareth, you know, the people I love the most, I don't, I can't do anything with because they just, I'm just Stan, but. <laughs> But Kathy reached out and said, my child is taking a journey that I don't understand, but I love him, her, I help. And I began taking that journey with Kathy, and Kathy's been an exemplar. She's a mama bear. She's, you guys, she's taken the journey really well. Val's dad, not so much, but Val has taken a really bold journey, lives here in Salt Lake, and so I got to call Val and have her come tonight. So that's why Val is here. So there's a piece of my life. I got to talk to Val. Val's fantastic. Yep. You should get to know Val. So um, uh, does anybody have a question that you would like to pose? I can bring you the microphone. And I, didn't, I just, uh, well, thank you. First off, that was very moving and, and helpful. Um, the I'm question. Just holding this. Okay, no, that works. Um, my, my question, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood the formula of how you had responded to uh, the 60-year-old woman um, who had uh, written you. Um, it, if, it, if you wouldn't mind just kind of recapping what you said, I, I wanted to make sure I understood how you reached her. I think we have to be very careful. When I'm dealing with a parent of an LGBTQ kid who's not accepting and affirming, I don't hit them with, you need to love your child. We're barking up the wrong tree. My dad's not affirming. I think my dad loves gay people more than gay people love gay people. <laughs> it's the way he views scripture. That's, and and I, I understand that. I, guys, I didn't change my heart toward queer people. I changed my mind about what the Bible said. And I know my heart didn't really change because when I changed my mind about what the scripture said, I was so relieved because I've always loved them. So just to oversimplify and tell people they need to love their kid more, number one, even telling queer people that we love them, within the Christian rubric, that's not a great compliment because we all know Jesus told us to love sinners, right? Queer people don't just deserve our love. Enemies deserve our love. They deserve our respect and celebration. So the bigger issue is moving to that. I have people, I, I still live in Nashville with 10,000 former parishioners who think I'm a heretic there. I can't go to the grocery store. And every day I have people walk up to me and tilt their heads sideways. And I, I see it's so, oh, I would rather them slap me. They look at me and, they, and they're so generous and magnanimous and they say, I want you to know <laughs> that I still love you. <laughs> and they think they're saying something profound, but in that word still, that word is freighted with, in spite of how bad you are, fortunate for you, I am deeply spiritual <laughs> and have the capacity to love you. So I think even this whole thing of we need to love them, love them, love them, that's not the complete story because love can be patronizing, that kind of love. They, uh, they deserve full celebration and respect and they don't want to be loved as an enemy. Or, it's like Jody and Mary, one of the first couples that I married, 
they were in our church for years, and people kept going up to Jody and Mary through our whole process and saying, hey, listen, I, I like this whole inclusion thing. You got your sin, I've got my sin, we're all covered by grace. I remember one day Mary, who is a brilliant woman, EDD, Assistant Superintendent of Clarksville School District, Mary was standing there beside Jody. They'd been together for 20 years. Maya, their daughter's, my daughter's age. And somebody said again, you got your sin, I've got my sin. We're covered. I'll never forget, I was there, and Mary said, yes, I have my sin. But she put her arm around Jody and Maya, and she said, but these aren't it. This is not a part of my life that needs your forgiveness or your magnanimity or your generosity. This is the most beautiful part of my life, my wife and my child, and I need a lot of forgiveness, but not for this. So that's why I, I said we gotta be really careful just pushing this, we just need to love, love, love. No, 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 they're, they're needing more than that. They're deserving of respect. And so I start with parents, and I don't start with, well, you don't love your child. Is there anything that would close your ears more than somebody who doesn't know your child telling you you don't love your child? That shuts me, it shut me down, but I appeal to them, I know you love your child because you love your child. Would you be willing to revisit this issue on the, on the grounds of your love for your child? So that's my rubric when I'm working, and it works a lot better, I think. And I think it's right. Anybody else? Do y'all ever get that? I still love you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, it's like, man, keep your love. You Thank know what's you. the worst? I get this all the time. We just don't know how you and Jeff do it. I just have loved your kid, and we I just know. admire you so much. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> She's a Mormon tab, by the way. Yeah. And I'm kind of, of fan-guying on that, for sure. Tabernacle choirs, you know, you talked about us. Yeah, yeah. Y'all and Gladys Knight. <laughs> um, I'm just curious as to, you know, with your time, working with parents and families, are you seeing a movement towards more acceptance more quickly? Are you seeing, uh, I, I'm hoping, I guess, as a parent that we're seeing um, that needle shift. Um, you know, I heard once that, you know, 20 years ago the needle was you choose the church over your child, and, and, and you know, as that shifts, choosing your child of the church and, and you're trying to find this middle ground where are you finding that needle are you finding it moving one way or another when you work down in the trenches it's very easy to get discouraged there's a reason in Galatians 5 Paul said be not weary in well-doing I think we all know there's a weariness that comes from wrongdoing but you guys know with me there is a weariness that comes from well-doing especially well-doing that is unrequited that doesn't feel like, I remember hearing Coretta Scott King speak in person, and it, she, though she was not commending the death of her husband, I remember her talking, it was a small group of us, hearing her, she said that she felt like his death almost saved him. She talked about his infidelity, she was very open about that. She said he was a man that was crumbling beneath the load. And she said the load that was most forcefully crumbling him was <coughs> discouragement. She said he was a terribly, the last 24 months of his life, he was terribly discouraged. She said as much as people heard him say it, she said, I live daily hearing him say his dream was turning into a nightmare. There is a weariness that comes from well-doing <coughs> and it not feeling like the needle's moving. Be not weary in well-doing for in due season says the one who a day is as a thousand years. <laughs> For in due season you will reap as you faint not. I do get weary because it doesn't feel like it's moving fast enough. But when I can find perspective and move back to 30,000 feet, there's incredible movement. For the mama bears to have gone from 1,400 to 40,000 in six years, I mean, there is an exponentiality, and the exponentiality, it's not shooting up with the y-axis, but there, I do feel like that grinding, slow, 
is beginning to find some edge up the y-axis. I mean, this didn't exist. I mean, where was this in the LDS church 15, 20 years ago? What I just said about Barack Obama. I mean, we forget that. He was still saying, no, not so much on marriage. I mean, the Marriage Defense Act, which president gave us that? Clinton, not Bush. So not as fast as we want, but yes, it's, it's happening. Is it, you know, how fast is it going to be? I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be slower than we want it to be. And I think this is even a harder issue than race and the color of skin. And I, the reason I think that is in terms of social psychology, when you get to the psychology, the personal part of it, I think human beings carry so much insecurity and insufficiency, what we would call shame, in their bodies, and that localizes so much beyond our bodies in our sexuality. I think that this is such an incredibly sensitive subject that a minority group, a sexual or gender minority group, has the capacity to serve as the scapegoat for all of our angst. And because we all have gone so many places insecurely in our minds with our bodies and our sexuality, it's just easier to project that onto a minority group that we can make worse than us and say, run, goat, run. And they're not just carrying their shame, they're making us feel better about ourselves for a moment. And I think because there's a lot of, I mean, Adam and Eve saw the fruit with their eyes, picked it with their hands, ate it with their mouth, digested it with the belly, and when the shame hit, what did they cover? It's where shame localizes in sexuality. They covered a part of themselves that they had not sinned with. Even their pristine state was not described as naked and not sinful. It was described as naked and not shame. Naked and not ashamed. The central issue was shame, not sin. I, I believe in sin, but the real issue was shame. And that sense of insufficiency is so fraught in human sexuality that I think this one's going to grind slower than we want it to. But I'm seeing great strides. I am so much more encouraged today than I was a year ago. But I, I, the slow part in 2012 when Grace Point, I mean, when we did this in 2015, I mean, Time Magazine, CBS, Morning News, NBC Nightly News, The Wall Street Journal, that's how exceptional it was. We weren't a mainline Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopal church. We were an evangelical church in the Bible Belt doing it. So it was so exceptional that all of those agencies came. And I remember thinking at that moment, this is going to open, this is going to be, this is going to open the gates. And pastors around the country who saw what we went through they saw the cannon fodder that we were, a lot that were towing the threshold of this backed off and said, I mean, who wants to lose 2,500 members? Who wants to go from a $1.8 million budget to a $300,000 budget in six months? Who wants to sell their campus? Who wants to lose their career? So I'm encouraged on one hand, but my encouragement is coming from grassroots, grassroots movements like Mama Dragons, Mama Bears, Peculiar, uh, I'll walk with you. All of these kinds of groups are where my encouragement is coming from. Preachers and bishops are not encouraging me. Because nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on him, but they would not confess him because they were afraid they would get put out of the synagogue. For they did love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And Jesus was right. It's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. And the riches of religion, not just money, there is a wealth that ministers and leaders have. They just have more to lose, and they're not, they're not squeezing through that camel's eye very well. So it's going to be up to us, the grassroots. That's why I'm, I've, I've left the professional guild, and I live my life with you guys. Anybody else? Sarah, I'm, okay, I'm just, second. A just second. Have. Just second. Just second. I'm projecting. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of like a deacon. I huh? am. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Where was I? <laughs> there's a, there's a quote, and I, 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 I'm sure you can remember it, but I, I just remember reading it as I was sitting in the Oakland airport, and it took me to tears while I'm sitting there waiting for an airplane. <laughs> but it was something to the effect that the that the uh, the bishops and the preachers, and the church leaders are playing with chips or plastic money, whereas the mothers are playing with flesh and blood. Can you can you remember that quote? I, I say that all the time in various ways, and I don't when it came to me, but I say the true prophets in this movement are the mothers and fathers of queer kids, because the rest of us, preachers, <laughs> clergy, leaders, we're playing with monopoly money and plastic chips. And you can only take a game so seriously when it's just plastic chips on the table. And so for a bunch of preachers to be sitting around abstracting about the tenses of Greek verbs in Romans 1, that's plastic chips and monopoly money. And you guys were sitting in those Sunday school classes and pews. You were listening and satisfied to be observers in those plastic chip monopoly money games. And then all of a sudden, one day, when you least expect it, the beating heart of your child threw on that table, on top of that pile of plastic chips, was your broken-hearted 16-year-old. Your child. And some people would say that that has led you to compromise, and I don't know who in their right mind would think that you would be less credible witnesses with the beating heart of your child on the table versus their monopoly money. If there's any credibility, you guys are the ones that are playing the game with your life on the line. And that sounds to my ear like a more credible witness than somebody just abstracting about theoretical ideas and the tenses of Greek verbs. So don't be diminished. Don't be, do not, and I know you're not. That's one thing I like about the, these parents. Um, you're pretty unabashed. When, and a lot, not all of you, but a lot of you have been in that psychiatric unit. A lot of you have sat with 12-year-olds and 18-year-olds who don't want to live, and that has scared you out of your mind. And... I don't think you lost your mind at that place. I think you found your heart at that place. And you will be damned if some preacher or religious leader is going to intimidate you on this because you're fighting for the life of your child. So you are the Marys among us. Okay. I got a microphone. So in Mormonism, we believe that we get to heaven together, that it's this um, group effort. So how do we help family members who feel like we've ruined their celestial families, their eternal families, by um, affirming our children? I have a trans daughter and a gay son, and my dad feels like I've ruined his eternal family by affirming my kids and letting them be who they are. So what suggestions you have to keep our family relations and also be able to affirm our kids? Yeah, the, I, I will say this, and I'm 54 years old, but I come from a very close family. Like, I, again, I told you, my dad's one of 15 kids. I'm one of 44 first cousins. Um, on my mom's side, I had my great-grandparents till I was 27. My great-grandparents, so we're, and we lived here, grandparents lived here, so, Everybody got married at 16 and had kids at 15. I mean, 17. <laughs> Some of both. But family has been everything for me, and I, I that's just, it's just hard. But where in the West are we going to get a chance to do anything that approximates the call of the one that said, if any man come after me, if any woman come after me, let them love me more than father, mother, sister, brother, wives, home, yea, and their own life. If you would follow me, pick up your cross. Where do we ever have a chance to pick up a cross 
and to fill up in our bodies the sufferings of Jesus, which were incomplete, because his own brothers and sisters didn't believe in him either. So our Savior has lived this experience, rejected by those closest to him. So I asked this question because I can't remember how you put it about your brain and your heart, but as, as far as like you changed the way you understood the scriptures, I'm not quoting you correctly, but I asked this question because of that. What, what scripture stories do you tell either parents or, or LGBT kids to give them comfort like from the scriptures if they want something like that? Yeah, I, I mean, there are so many scriptures. I always, uh, the, the Gentile inclusion story, I always start there because we were certain right out of the chute that these people had no access and we were wrong. But when people, I always start, I try to unsettle them first and show them that the hermeneutic I've used on the LGBTQ issue, they're already using on a hundred other issues. When people say, where did you get this interpretive lens from the liberals? No, 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 from you. We already use this, we just use it conveniently, selectively, and inconsistently. When people say, yeah, but I'll, I know all those other things, but Stan, on this, the scripture's clear. I always am like, okay, maybe it is. Maybe, maybe Paul is clear, but can I ask you a question? Tell me if this is clear. First Peter 2, slaves, be submissive to your masters even if they beat you without cause. Tell me if this is clear. For to this you were called by Christ. Tell me how clear that is. I'll tell you how clear that is. The bulk of Christianity defended slavery for 19 centuries because that scripture is so clear. So I first try to unsettle them on how just unclear we have already proven the scripture is on many things so that's generally where I start and if they're unwilling to go there I'm probably I try to soften people's grasp of certainty because I honestly in the Sermon on the Mount I always tell people in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus talked about humility meekness he talked about disposition of soul more than position of mind disposition of heart more than position of doctrine and it's not about being right and being certain. Humility is a higher virtue than clarity, acuity, and certainty. So I, with most evangelicals or LDS folk, I can already show them at least six examples from women's hair to whatever, that we are already doing this with scripture, putting it in context. And so, yeah, is it really that clear? Sorry, I guess I guess my husband and I are going to take the lead, but um, I know I talked to you about this already earlier. But as you're talking, and as I'm hearing other people's questions, um, I kind of feel like every one of us here has felt sideswiped or disappointed at some point, or has lost something, or has had a family relationship strained, or and um, I found you through Jill's podcast, um, which I'm so grateful for, Jill, by the way. Um, and you told the story of Mary, and tonight you called us Marys. And so I was wondering if you would tell that story again um, of, you know, when you were found in Grace Point. Um, I was just wondering if you would share it with us again. Mostly just because I want to hear you say it. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll give the cursory overview because it could go long and I know we're running out of time. But uh, when, when my own disorientation was beginning, or I was really in the, in, in the crux of it actually, and we were, we were talking about starting Grace Point, I, I was studying for an Easter sermon and I noticed in studying for the Easter sermon, there were a bunch of Marys in the New Testament story. And I, got a I, I was a little troubled because here was this theologian, scriptorian, but I couldn't keep the Mary straight. So I, um, 
I'm a pretty good Jeopardy guy, memorizer, and I, so I always knew every statistic of every NFL, NBA, MLB player. I, know, I still know statistics, and I could still hear my grandmother when I would be rattling off Tony Gwynn's batting average, you know, and, and OPS. My grandmother said, yes, but can you name the 12 disciples? You know, that kind of thing. So I had that guilt, and I was like, I, I don't keep them, I can't keep the Mary straight. So I made a grid, or six Marys in the New Testament, for whatever reason that day, I think it was divine. I know my attention focused on one of the Marys. It was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. They lived at Bethany. And I noticed, for whatever reason, unguided, unless it were God, that she was in scripture three times. And for whatever reason, I honed in on her, not Mary, the mother of Cleopas, or the other Mary, I just honed in on her. The three times were Luke 10, John 11, John 12. Luke 10, watch this. Luke 10, Mary and Martha invite Jesus to their home. Martha's in the kitchen, remember, cooking. The Bible says Mary is at the feet of Jesus learning, right? Martha comes out, hands on hips, looks at Jesus, looks at Mary, and says, make her get in the kitchen and help me. The Bible says she was learning of him. Her sister castigates her. Jesus steps in, looks at Martha, and says, leave her alone. She's doing what she needs to do. One story. The last story, John 12, it's Monday or Tuesday of the Passion Week. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. They're in Bethany where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live, and a guy named Simon is throwing a party to celebrate Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. And John 12 says, Lazarus was at the head of the table. The disciples were all there. And Mary comes in with a pound of ointment of spikenard. And guess what? She goes to the feet of Jesus. She starts what we would call worship. She starts anointing his feet with oil, pouring out her devotion to him in a sacramental worship form. Similarity. Both stories, she's at the feet of Jesus. The first story, she's learning. The last story, she's worshiping. First story, Martha castigates, Jesus defends. This story, you remember? Judas steps in and says, what's she doing? Make her get up. We could have given that to the poor. Jesus steps in and says, leave her alone. Both times she's at the feet of Jesus. Both times she's rebuked by people close to her. Both times Jesus defends what she's doing. Middle story. Evidently, she had learned so much at the feet of Jesus. When her brother Lazarus was sick and dying, she told a servant, I know Jesus. I've learned a lot from him. I've gone through all the classes. Go find Jesus in Perea. Bring him back. He'll heal my brother. Servant goes to Perea, says, Jesus, Mary and Martha sent me. They said to tell you that Lazarus, the one you love, is dying, and they need you to come. The Bible says when Jesus heard this, he sat down. No explanation, he just sat down. The servant rebuffed goes back, and when he comes in the home, surely Mary and Martha said, where is he? Because Mary knew, I mean, she'd learned a lot, surely. And the servant stubs his toe and fiddles with the brim of his hat. And Mary says, where is he? And the servant says, uh, yeah, um, he, he did not, he didn't come. And I can hear Mary, well, what, he must have sent his word like he did to the centurion servant, sent the word and said it's gonna be okay. And the, and the servant said, no. And Mary says, well, what did he say? And the servant says he didn't say anything. What did he do? He just sat down. She stands there by her brother's bedside, little palliative care, and watches him insufferably die over the next few days, buries him. Jesus doesn't even have the decency to show up for the funeral. Three days later in Priya, Jesus stands up, looks at his disciples and says, we need to go to Bethany. 
Lazarus has died. And the disciples, I mean, everybody's like, well, the red letters are easy. No, 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 even Jesus is tough to figure out sometimes. The disciples are like, well, if he's dead, why are we going to go now? Because things are politically hot for you over there. Then we're all going to be dead. What's the point? Jesus then says this cryptic thing, because even the red letters are hard sometimes to understand. He says, he's dead, and I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there. What's that? John 11 says that Jesus comes walking up to their house, and the servant runs in and says, the master's coming. Ma the scripture literally says, Martha jumped up and ran out to meet Jesus. And as she was going, the scripture says, but Mary sat down. And Martha turns around and looks at her and says, sis. And Mary is where a lot of you have been. I've been there. Mary looks at Martha and says, I don't have anything to say to him. I'm done with him. Martha goes out, and Jesus and Martha have this thick theological exchange. Theologians call it realized eschatology, where he explains people who die in relation to him don't really die, and the resurrection's already happened, but not yet, and all this thick stuff, and it satisfies Martha. And Martha's like, okay. Martha goes back in the house and says, sis, he asked me to tell you he wants to see you. See, this isn't Job's God who walks in and says, don't question me. Who do you think you are? Where were you when I created the lion and the bleed? Who, who do you think you are? I know you lost 10 kids, but you don't talk back to me. This isn't Job's God. Jesus stands on the porch. He doesn't kick down the door. He doesn't walk in and look at Mary sitting there and say, what are you doing? You don't question me. You should have been out here with Martha. If you'd been out with Martha, you would have heard an incredible thick theological discussion of realized eschatology. The Bible says he stands, oh, the decent Jesus. He stands on the porch and he sends an invitation and says, I want to see you. The Bible says, Martha cajoles Mary. Mary finally begrudgingly gets up, and she goes out and get this. When she sees Jesus, you know what the Bible says? She fell at his feet. She's in scripture three times. All three times, she's at the feet of Jesus. The first time learning, we call that Christian education and have entire wings of our church and industries dedicated to it. The last time she's worshiping, we have entire industries and choirs with a thousand people in them and spend millions of dollars and call our services worship services. We have entire industries. Our spaces are called worship spaces. We have dedicated so much architecture, money, and time to education and worship, and it's fine. But the church sucks, stinks at providing the middle space. The space where she fell down at his feet and she wasn't learning and she wasn't worshiping, but she looks up at him and says, if you would have been here, and who do you think you are? And how could you have let this happen? And he doesn't look down at her and say, no, who do you think you are? The Bible said he silently picks her up as she curses him and says, where is he? And they silently walk, talking no theology, but the silence is theology. They silently walk to the tomb, and when they get to the tomb, the miracle in the story is not the stone rolled away and Lazarus walked out. The miracle of the story, the real story, is he stands there, and when he gets to the tomb, he doesn't say anything, but the Bible gives us a two-word verse that's the smallest in the Bible and the thickest theology in the whole book. The Bible said, he wept. And she saw him crying. And everything that didn't make sense about the theology and everything that still didn't make sense about the theology and a heart that really didn't feel like worshiping. And she 
leans her head on his shoulder and he puts his head down and the tears of God mingle with the tears of humanity and there are no academic answers but the heart of man begins to heal in the space where Christ allows us to fall at his feet and fall apart and we built Grace Point and it's still what I do with people and I said there are plenty of churches providing space for learning and worship we are going to provide a space for people to fall at the feet of Jesus and cuss and fall apart and not understand. And we're going to expect not the words of God, but the tears of God to come into that space and meet us in our pain. And it's been the most enriching. And it was out of that that the LGBTQ inclusion thing came. But that's been the underlying premise. And so, you know, I don't know how much worship and learning is happening at places like this because I think there's still lots of us that are in that middle space. And honestly, I think if you skip the middle space, I think the superficial jump from learning to worshiping, I don't know, I think, and I think it's proven by the story, it just hit me. It wasn't Lazarus who was raised from the dead who was at the feet of Jesus worshiping, and it wasn't Martha who got the thick theology about realized eschatology. It was Mary who was allowed to fall apart at his feet and grind her way through the cursing. She's the one. I think for people like us, we don't have to become agnostics and atheists and lose our faith. It just might be that through these tears and our anger that our worship might be refined more purely than it ever could have been because of these heartbreaks, these things that drove us to his feet in tears. I don't know how the Christian church has lived 2,000 years with the story of Mary, and nobody's ever talked about that, but I, I'll be doggone. I think I found, like, the theory of relativity. I don't know how <laughs> anybody has missed. She's in Scripture three times, and it's the same thing. She's doing something good. She's castigated by other religious people. Jesus defends, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Who castigated her in the second one? The church for the last 2,000 years. And, well, when did Jesus defend her? when he reached down and picked her up and didn't say a damn word, but cried with her. That's the space that we're living in, and so it's a lovely space. And anywho, that's good, isn't it? That's good. I like, I'm like that old preacher in the Pentecostal church, he says, oh, I about blessed my own self right there. <laughs> okay, anybody else have one or two more quick questions. I think that's a great place to end. I thank you so much for bringing spirit here. Thank you. I'm, I, I'm honored. I'm sorry for uh, the first time I've been with you guys. My dad always said that a good sermon is one with a good beginning and a good ending and those two as close together as you can get them. <laughs> I haven't learned that lesson, but thank you for bearing me. Okay. I just want to say one thing when you're talking about disappointment. I, I think that is one of the things that these young people, when they first come out, it's very hard because a lot of them feel like, you know, I have disappointed my parents. Mm. And I think that's really a hard thing for them because they do not know how they're going to be accepted, even by their own parents or family. I, I think, and I, I've said, maybe I quoted tonight, I don't ever think that I have even approximated what these kids are feeling, but the heartbreak of disappointing my dad or feeling like I've messed it up his celestial afterlife, for your dad, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of a smaller mansion. For my dad, I've messed up his celestial afterlife, but he's going to have to not have me in heaven and I'm going to be burning forever, but that disappointment is, is so hard. But all of us that are dealing with our parents, our kids' grandparents, and all the disappointment that comes with that, if we say we are an ally and we're not getting hit by the stones thrown at our children, we are not standing close enough. Because what we're feeling with our dads pales in comparison to what flows in their veins with their friends and their teachers and every time they walk down the street, the disappointment they think they are to the whole world. So in, in that disappointment, we join them. We just have to relieve this world of that religious angst of disappointment because there's no reason to be disappointed. They're beautiful. Can you say that one more time about if we're not getting hit? 
if you say, for those of you, well, I'll just leave it at this. If you say you're an ally to a group of people and you're not getting hit by the stones thrown at them, you are not standing close enough. I've quoted it three times tonight, but it's one of my favorites. Colossians 2, this is a remarkable line. We are filling up in our body the sufferings of Jesus, which were incomplete. To look at Golgotha, to look at Calvary, and to think that was an incomplete suffering. Yes, it was an incomplete suffering. For every queer child that has cried, for every queer child that has felt the rejection of their dad, that is the suffering of the body of Christ. And for us to be able to join them and to lose our recommend or to lose ordination, to lose, that's, um, I count it all joy that I might be able to bear in my body the sufferings of Christ. So we aren't martyrs. We are honored associates of the wounded one. And oh, to the day when righteousness will no longer bear wounds and goodness will no longer be maligned. Until that day, arc bends ever so imperceptibly toward justice. And I will admit, sometimes through the prism of tired tears, it looks like the arc is bending the other way. But most of the time my eye is clear and I still see that through people like you also. I guess we all ought to eat some more soup. We have one, one last, more. we have one last question, well, sorry. Not a question, um, an offering. Um, so something that makes this bearable is having the fellowship of each other to lift and, and keep each other up. Um, there are thousands of parents like us throughout the country, throughout the world, and I want you to take a message to this mama who so the mama whatevers, don't love my child more than I do. We do not love your child more than you do. We love your child with you. We add our love to yours, and we want to hold you up in your efforts to be there for your child. Um, I represent the Mama Dragons Wrapped in Hugs program. This isn't an official Mama Dragons thing, but it's something that we want to offer to you from just some of the mamas. Um, blankets for kiddos that you minister to. Um, let me know where to send them when you feel inspired or impressed that someone needs to be wrapped in the love of other mamas as well. well I will. Um, and this one I want you to have because if Martin Luther King Jr. can get discouraged and want to give up, we are so vulnerable to that as well. And so I want you to feel like you have us holding you up in your ministry as well. So you can maybe squish it into your suitcase and take it on the plane. If not, let us know where to send it, and we can send it to you, too. I will, but I will take it with me. Okay. Thank you for your work. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Gosh. It's been a long 10 years. And I think many of us can relate to this. We're not safe with many leaders and people that we should be safe with. I told my mom, isn't it ironic I'm having a Mormon get together with a pastor? <laughs> what is wrong with this picture? There's nothing wrong. We are so honored to have you part of this movement and to be heard and to be seen and to know that we're a part of a really incredible movement, a sacred movement. Just thank you from the bottom of my heart because I think so many of us have felt so unheard. So thank you.